Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Thank Furlow, it's Friday. Uh, we've had a bit of a mad dash here, actually, uh, just trying to get on. Uh, I think Jackie was uh, got fingers crossed that I wasn't going to make this one. She's going to keep it all to herself. But anyway, never mind. Uh, Jackie is, as always, here with me. I'm told she's got a lot to get through today, so I'm pleased about that. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go straight over to Jackie. She can start, because some of the things I want to cover, she might actually be giving me the up-to-date answers on anyway. So hello again, Jackie. How are you doing? Oh, and you've got the... Uh, the, the nice big necklace on there that everybody's been talking about. So that's good. Oh. <laughs> and, yeah, this uh, slightly different one. Hi, yeah. good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, now I'm glad you're here, Gary, because I actually choose to do on my own. And it's very lonely doing it on your own, actually. It's lovely speaking to people and writing answers and things and talking, but it's not quite the same as having two of us there to bounce off each other, I have to say. That is true, actually, yes. And I find also if you've got one guest that you talk to, it's not quite so. If you've got two, at least when one yeah. drives, you can talk to the other one. Yeah. But I don't think there's yeah. much chance of either you or me drying up. So anyway, um, on you go. That will be the day, <laughs> Gary. That will be the day. <laughs> right. Hi, everyone. Uh, quite a lot to get through today. So what I've done is I've done some um, PowerPoint notes just so that you can see it all up on the screen. Um, so, oh, hang on. Let me share my screen first of all. Let's get this the right way. It's Friday afternoon and share my screen. And uh, start. Okay. Um, so, thank you, fellow. It's Friday. So, now, before we start, I have a coronavirus conundrum to discuss with you that I'm going to put up now because I'd like you to sort of think about this. It's a problem that we discussed, I discussed with a member this week, and I just, it's a sort of ethical thing again. Um, and I just like your thoughts on it. So I thought if I put it up at the start, if you get bored with what I'm saying, you can sit and think and, and send some, some notes over. So this is to do with uh, coronavirus, furlough and pay slips. Now, this is the case study. If you remember, uh, way back in March last year, we discussed when we were putting the furlough claims through that it would be a good idea to show the furlough separately as an item on the payslip so everybody knew what they were getting for furlough and then when you go to post it to your accounts you've got the furlough you've paid you've got any top-ups that you've paid and when we got on to flexible furlough because the hourly rates are different with flexible furlough you're supposed to show any different hourly rates um, on a payslip separately so if you're working basic hourly rate and then weekend you get time and a half or whatever, you have to show this separately on the payslip. And that's a rule that came out last April. Now, a lot of uh, people have been making the top up, so they've been paying the full wages. It just happens to be that they're claiming 80% back. But let's assume that uh, you've been doing your payslips and you've been showing the furlough payments separately. Now, the conundrum is this. We have, uh, it's been brought to our attention that some financial advisors uh, working with uh, mortgage lending companies are now asking for pay slips not to have furlough split out for mortgage applications. And they're saying you don't want to show, we don't want you showing furlough on your mortgage applications uh, because the, um, the building societies don't want that. They want proper pay slips. So the question is this, why do you think this is happening? Why do you think they want to know uh, what's, what, the, the financial advisors are saying, please don't separate out the furlough. Um, should we ethically issue new pay slips for employee use, which shows a single income, if you've been averaging out, it may not be an hourly rate, it may just be a single amount of income, rather than splitting out and showing the furlough separately? And do you think there is an issue with this? So that's my conundrum. Uh, this it's particular really time, easy one. Sorry? Yeah. It's an easy one, yeah. It's an easy one, yeah. Um, so the, uh, we, we have an employee who's gone for a mortgage, produced the payslips for uh, proof of income. The financial advisor has said you don't want payslips with uh, furlough on because that won't be very acceptable by the building society. So can you go back and can you get payslips that just show what you've been paid? So the question is, why do you think they're doing this? Should our member ethically, in agreement with the employer, issue new paces we're not saying we're going to change anything on rti because the rti isn't going to change the accounts are not going to change it's just the pay slips that you're giving to the employee and can you see an issue with this so that's the conundrum 
So uh, when you get round there, if you haven't already started putting some uh, thoughts up, just want to see what you think about that one. Okay, so let's have a look. There's a lot come out of HMRC this week. Just a reminder, um, 1st of March sees the change for VAT for the construction industry scheme to domestic reverse charge. Now, uh, we had uh, a quite lengthy technical Tuesday on this, uh, this week, and a lot of questions came out of that. I think by the end of it, we answered all the questions. Um, there is an article that's going out in the newsletter when that goes out, which covers everything that's in there. It's an update from the one I did last year. It's also an update on what I did for the summit back in November. So there's an article going out and uh, the video is there. Now, at the moment, the video for Technical Tuesdays is sitting in the Brexit Hub. That, now, I've spoken to the team and we're going to try and get a separate place sorted out for that. So for all the Technical Tuesday, they're currently sitting in the Brexit. So if you want to watch the CIS one, go on to the Brexit Hub. And on the right hand side, it says Brexit te or Technical Tuesday webinars. Click on that and you'll see the one that I did on CIS till we get it finally sorted out where it is. So that's the first one. Now, following on from that, we were talking about charging um, VAT and um, not charging VAT on materials. Now, there has been an update on that this week, so we will get this out to you. There's been a confirmation come out from HMRC and the CIS legislation is actually changing for this. So if you're involved in CIS, I will get something out to you. I've literally seen that this morning. So beware of that because there are going to be some legislation changes to how you do with materials and the new domestic reverse charge. Um, don't forget the off payroll working rule was coming from the 6th of April. Now that shouldn't affect our members very much because it's the way that anybody who is um, who has an off payroll contract. So we're talking really about IR35 that's now with a medium or a large company, the decision on whether IL35 has got to be implemented is now made by the, uh, the client, the customer, not the limited company that's providing the service. Um, so that will affect your clients if they are at limited companies and subcontracting their business out to medium and large companies for contracts, that will affect them. But as our clients are unlikely to be medium and large, they probably won't have to take that decision for subcontractors, but they might, may find that that decision is taken for them. So that comes into play on the from the 6th of April. So if you've got clients uh, who are limited companies who subcontract out and they fall under IL35, remember that the rules are changing and that's going to affect the tax and NI because if the limited company is deemed to fall under IL35, then tax and national insurance will be deducted from their invoices and then it will play back because they will be treated basically as an employee of the contractor. So now this one appeared, Scots love to do differently. I love you all. You do like to confuse the issue. This is a payroll based one and we will cover this. Somebody I know is going to do a payroll update before the 6th of April, but the Scottish government have launched a new student loan plan. It's called Plan 4, and that's coming in from April 2021. Now, I don't have any more details on it than that, but if you are in pay, if you are doing payroll, if you've got people who um, will fall under this Scottish uh, student loan now, what I'm not sure about is whether it's anyone who has a, a student loan that lives in Scotland or it's anyone who has a loan for a degree from a Scottish university, which I think is more likely. Um, that will affect you from April with, with the payments and the loans that you need to put through. But I'm sure when uh, the payroll person does the, the payroll updates, then you, you'll get that from them. Um, now, Agent 82 uh, update has come out. Now, for anyone who downloads the Agent update, oh, and uh, we have in the chat line, you will see some links going up in the, in the chat line rather than me asking, uh, Iris, who's anchoring today to put them up. I've already sent the links to her and she's putting them up in the in the chat line. So you will see some links. This is the first one, I think, and it's agent issue number 82 is coming out. There's quite a lot of information in that. Um, it caught me out this morning because the format's changed. Anyone who's downloaded the uh, agent updates, it, it was always a beautifully laid out uh, document where you could click on various tabs. Now it, it's not that at all. And it's all to do with uh, readability of it. So they've changed the format and now everything is just, just in, in a, on a screen. 
So watch out, don't get caught out if you look at it and it's changed. Now, um, H Her, Her Majesty's Treasury have announced, now I don't know whether this is a standard thing or whether it's new for this year. Um, budget day, I think is the 3rd of March, I think, Gary, if I'm yeah. right, 3rd of March. Yeah. Now, there are various things that now the government can do, which are to do with tax, which do not have to go through the budget. They don't have to be announced as part of the budget. So on the 23rd, um, the Treasury is going to announce something called a command paper with tax policies and consultation. So it's their basic plan as to where they're going as far as the changes that they want to make for the tax policy. And uh, I'll, as soon as that's issued, I'll get some information. I'll look at that. I'll go through all those. Now, the bottom one one there, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this. Uh, it may or may not affect uh, people, um, members with clients, but this came out from uh, the High Court, Court of Appeal today. Um, Uber drivers, the decision has been taken that Uber drivers will not are to be classed as workers, not self-employed. Now, this is going to have a this this will have a massive knock on effect because it depends on the the way they work, their holidays and all that sort of thing and the rights they're entitled to and everything else as an Uber driver. And it may open up Uber to a lot of claims for back holiday pay and things like that. This is going back about five or six years now. We all know how long this has been going on. So that was an interesting decision that came out this morning. It was literally announced uh, about half past nine this morning. Um, but not only is it going to affect Uber, but it's actually going to have a knock on effect to anyone else who works through an app like this, where they log into an app. And one of the things that uh, they're going to have to do is when you're looking at the working hours, which is what is going to determine things like holiday pay and that sort of thing, their working hours will be deemed to be from the moment they log into the app to the moment that they log out of the app. So regardless of what they're actually doing in that time, it looks to me from reading it quickly this morning that when an Uber driver is logged into their app, they are considered to be workers for Uber and hence that's gonna determine a whole host of things. So yeah. those are the things that have come out this week that I've seen, as I said, there's a lot coming out at the moment. Remember, we're rapidly heading to the end of the fiscal year, six of, uh, fifth, sixth of April. Um, everything's changing. There's a lot of changes to payroll, uh, a lot of tax, tax things coming out. So I'm sure over the next couple of weeks, you're gonna be really busy with this. But that's everything that is uh, non-COVID related that I found. So a few bits coming out on uh, coronavirus job retention scheme. Um, you can now submit your claim periods uh, for February um, and they must be made by the 15th of March. So they can be made, they could have been made in advance. So just a reminder that if you're doing your February claims, we're very close to the end of February now, you can start to make your February claims. You can claim up to the end of February and you've got to the 15th of March to do that. Um, now, we have mentioned late claims before, but I just want to tie up a few loose ends that were around from a week or so ago. Now, from the 1st of November, which is when the new flexible furlough came in, um, HMRC will uh, accept a late claim from you if you have, it says they're all of the following, but there were 13 of them, so I shunted them down. Um, if you have a reasonable excuse, now, if you look at that, there are a list of 12 reasonable excuses, but the one that I've noticed that's come in this week with apologies to HMRC is that one, which I have not seen before. So a reasonable excuse now includes an HMRC error prevented, prevented you from making your claim. Now, I know there are times when perhaps the line's gone down or something like that, or you need queries and you've got to ring them and you can't get through to them because... If you're making a claim for someone that doesn't have a national insurance number, you have to do it over the telephone and sometimes you can't get through. Now, I had I picked up somewhere this week and I'm not sure it may have been on one of the forums that somebody rang to do a claim for somebody who hasn't got a national insurance number. So they claimed for that person. Then at the end of the month, they went in to claim everybody else's and couldn't claim it because they'd already made a claim for February. So be very, very careful. You can only make one claim in a month. And if you have to ring up because you don't have a Nino number for someone, 
You've got to do the whole claim by telephone. You can't do it in more than one go. So be very, very careful uh, when, you're, when you're making these claims. Um, now, they have changed the way you can actually uh, submit those late claims. Now, I had an email from my contact at HMRC yesterday with a link to the document. But in fact, I couldn't actually see what the differences were. If you follow the links through that they gave you, um, it literally just takes you through to signing onto your government gateway. So you make your late claim through, the, through your government gateway login. So either you as an agent or you as an individual. So uh, a few bits there. Um, I think we may have that, something there up on the link about that. But if not, it's if you go on to gov.uk and put in uh, claim for CGIS, you get the various links come up anyway. Now let's just uh, finalize what's happened if you claim too much or not claimed enough, because I'm getting some queries coming through about changing claims. Um, so uh, I don't know if you can see that. Let me just uh, move that down. Um, so if you have claimed too much, now this is slightly differently to something I may have said last week. If you've claimed too much, you can still claim it back in your next pay claim. So you just reduce the payment you made. Now, I thought you had to contact them, but that's not right. If, you're, if you've overclaimed and you want to pay it back, or if you decide you want to pay back anything else because for previous months, you claim it back normally through your next claim. Now, if you're not making another claim, you get um, a payment reference number from HMRC, and you have to pay it back within 30 days. So that's if you've claimed too much. But if you've not claimed enough, therefore you've actually claimed too little, um, you still need to make sure that the employees have been paid and then you contact HMRC to amend the claim. Now that's the one that I think you may have to do by telephone, but it might also work with the link. Now, I'm sure if somebody's done this, they will come on and let us know that, yes, you can do that online. I can only get so far with this and then I get hit with a government gateway login. So there's not much further I can go. But remember, if you've underclaimed, they're going to want an awful lot more information from you than if you've overclaimed and you're paying it back. And you might find you need to do additional checks, prove what you're claiming um, and everything else. So remember that any claims for periods ending on it on or before the 31st of October are now definitely closed. You can't make any changes. You can't make any amendments to those. Um, you can't add to existing claims. You can't do anything. And um, the for claims relating after the 1st of November, you will only be able to increase the amount of the claim if you amend it within 28 calendar days after the month the claim relates to, unless it falls on a weekend or a bank holiday, when it will be the next working day. So for example, if you're going up to the 31st of December, the deadline was the 28th of January. If you're claiming for January, the deadline for changing that will be the 28th of February. Now, I don't know what happens if you're making a late claim and you need to change it. You'll have to sort of sort that out with HMRC if you're in that situation. Okay. Now, I spoke last week or the week before about what HMRC are doing uh, about the publication of the claims. Now, this is a list that's going out from HMRC. It comes out in the form of a downloadable spreadsheet um, of all the companies that have claimed the from the job retention scheme from the 1st of December. So um, last month, they, uh, sorry, from last month, HMRC are listing a monthly list of employees who are claiming. And that can be linked in, it can be downloaded. It's a very large document because it's got everybody that's made a claim. And last month, they simply had the names of the employers. Now, that may not be the same as your employer name. It's the name that the employee is registered under the PAYE scheme. Now, from the next version of this goes out on the 25th of November, and we had an update meeting with HMRC, the tax agent group this week, just to get an update from them on this. And that information is now going to include uh, the employer name, any company registration number if they are a limited company, but there's nothing there if they're not. So it's just be blank if they're a, a non-incorporated business. Um, and the banded amounts of how much the claim was for, nothing in there <laughs> at all about employees. 
and I went up um, last week, I think we looked at the bandings, I haven't put them on here, but I think the largest one was well over a million pounds in the month. So, sorry, let me just cancel, right, my phone's beeping at me. Um, now, you can apply and uh, actually agents can do this now, from this week agents can do this. If your client thinks that publishing these details is going to result in a serious risk of violence or intimidation to either them or employees or whatever else, they can request that the details that they claim are not published. Now, basically what's happened is HMRC have had some applications to be taken off the list. I don't know how many, I don't know what percentage it is, but they have had some people and you will see now that once that application has been made and HMRC have received it, that name is then removed from there while they decide on whether it's relevant that that name should be removed, if you see what I mean. But what this means is that each month they are going to issue an updated spreadsheet for each month. So when they issue the December version next week, it will be an amended version with maybe names taken out from the first version, plus some additional information on the, the, the band that the claim is falling into. Now, there's no way that the earlier spreadsheet can be taken out of the public domain because it's up there, it's downloadable, so it is still there. So, I mean, it is possible if anybody really wants to, to check. Because what will happen also is that if, an employer has paid back the claim from the previous month. Let's say they've made a claim and they thought, well, actually, we shouldn't have made that. We're going to repay it back. Because a lot of people are actually paying their claims back now, some of the larger companies. Yeah. Their name will then be removed from the list. So if they haven't made a claim, they will be removed from the list, but they will still be there from the previous month. So there is a sort of a comparison going on. Now, also from the 25th of February, an employee can now go onto their personal tax account and check what claim has been made on their behalf. So they can now see this in their own personal tax account. Now, I had quite an amusing conversation with uh, two members earlier this week to say that with the best will in the world, the employees would not know what a personal tax uh, account was for them if you sat them in front of the screen and showed it to them. But having said that, a lot of people do use their personal tax accounts and you might very well find that you get some queries on this. Now, this, don't forget, it's nothing to do with the employer. This is the employee who can now log in through the government gateway to their personal tax account and see exactly how much uh, furlough has been claimed for them. Now, this is going to help possibly uh, for the whistleblowing fraud type thing, because if somebody has claimed an employer has claimed, that claim will appear in the, the general bulk spreadsheet that's going out. But if someone's been told that uh, they're not being paid furlough or that they're not being paid because they've not been furloughed or whatever, and a furlough has been claimed for them, that will appear on their personal tax account. So I don't know, I, I was thinking they might have been laid off or something and told, actually, you know, you're, you're not working for us anymore. We've laid you off. Go on to the personal tax account. Well, hang on a minute. You claim furlough for me last month. So it's a way of perhaps checking forward and giving individuals uh, the right to be able to see what's been claimed for them. So sort of a bit long winded that, but I think you can see uh, where we get to. Yeah. So that's the one. Okay, now this one I saw uh, popped up uh, yesterday. I saw this. Now I don't know when this came out, but the UK government has provided an additional 1.1 billion pounds to help for the coronavirus in Scotland. Now, I don't know when this was announced. It came into me via an email from HMRC this week. So it's obviously fairly new. So some extra funding going to Scotland. Um, the total fund, additional funding for coronavirus to Scotland is now 9.7 billion this year, on top of the normal business support that the businesses in Scotland get. Now, what can happen is, because we're near the end of the financial, of the fiscal year, um, that 1.1 billion can be carried over. It doesn't have to be spent this year by the 5th of April. So it can be carried over towards uh, the 21-22 year, which obviously starts on the 6th of April. Um, and that's on top of the existing tool to transfer funds across from one year to the other if it's not spent. So if you're involved in that at all in Scotland, you will probably understand far more about that than, than I do. 
Now, unfortunately, I've had nothing, no information on uh, Wales or Northern Ireland, so I don't know whether there's additional funding for those. Um, and uh, but it was just came out about Scotland uh, this week. So, right, moving away from coronavirus, a little bit came out on a company's house, which I thought was probably worthwhile mentioning again. Now, as you're aware, things like penalties for late filing, the actual filing periods have been extended, I think, from nine months to 12 months recently. But this came out from Companies House, and we know that the, the filing penalties will start to come back into play if you're late filing with your accounts. Now, this is only for filing annual accounts. It's not for filing the annual return of directors and shareholders and things, just that. Just a reminder then of when your accounts for a limited company are due at Companies House, um, I've only picked up private companies and uh, limited liability partnerships here. So the first set of accounts um, must be delivered to Companies House within 21 months of the date of incorporation or three months from the accounting reference date, whichever is longer. So maximum there of 21 months, I would think. And subsequent accounts um, have to be submitted within nine months from the end of the accounting reference period to deliver the accounts. Now, as I understand, uh, over the last year, that's been extended to 12 months. I would imagine uh, that's, I don't know if that's already come in from the 1st of January, whether it's coming in from the 1st of April. So watch uh, for the fact that your filing periods will have shortened back to what they normally are. Um, who is responsible? A director or designated member of the LLP is responsible for delivery. Delivery means actual receipt at company's house in the correct format. And if those accounts are late, a penalty is automatically imposed. So these are the penalties that are accruing. Um, only accounts, this is for. Um, the level of penalty depends on how late the accounts are. And if you are late to successive years running, with your accounts, the penalties are doubled. So if your accounts are uh, within a month, if they're, they're under a month late, it's 150. Mm -hmm. Between one month and three months, it's 375, going up to 750 pounds. And if your accounts are more than six months late, the fine is 1,500 pounds. So if you do that in two years time, the next year, the fine is gonna be 3,000 pounds for submitting your accounts more than six months late. So I just thought it might be worth, as it came out this week and there was some information going around, so it might be worthwhile mentioning it. Now, this came out today on the EU VAT, and I've been talking to a member this morning about this, and I've just emailed her this bit of information. Before I show you what the, the, the bulletin comment was, um, we have spent a lot of time on our Brexit webinars talking about selling, exporting. Uh, we also talked about online um, marketplace selling. But one of the things if you're selling into the EU is that import VAT at the other end has to be paid. Now, if you remember, or if you've been involved in this, you will know that either you export, sell it at zero rate, don't charge your customer VAT, but they have to pay import VAT at the other end. And that's gonna be a charge on them before it will actually be delivered. Um, the other one is that the seller pays all the fees and gets it delivered at the other end. But we weren't quite sure how that was going to work. And the third one, which is the large one, was, well, we're going to have to register for VAT in the EU and charge them EU VAT. Now, having talked to a lot of people about this, and we, I'm so absolutely astounded at the number of our members who have clients who deal with EU customers. Um, so this is something we are going to be following up on quite a lot. Um, but the majority of the queries that I've been having are from people who are selling, not through an online marketplace, because the online marketplace will deal with the VAT for you or should deal with the VAT for you, but who are selling either through uh, their own website or just selling directly and mailing individual, maybe two, three or four items a month or something like that. And it's a general consensus has been that it's probably not worth, if you're in that situation, registering for VAT <coughs> until the 1st of July when the VAT system changes in Europe. Um, but to somehow sell those goods, export them at zero rate and work out how your customer is going to pay them at the other end. OK, um, one member uh, has clients have put a little notice on their website that says, uh, please note there may be additional charges um, 
at the other end before the goods arrive. Now, this came out this morning uh, on an HMRC bulletin, and it was a question that had come up on their FAQs, I think. And it was, I said, now I put brackets around the word sample because <coughs> I think this is the same for whatever you sell. By my courier, by courier to my EU customers from my shop in Great Britain. Now, I don't think that matters whether it's an online shop, your own online website. So if you've got your own website or if you've got a website on, say, Shopify, which we've accepted now, is not an online marketplace and you're responsible for the VAT. So you're selling it to your customers. How can I pick up the VAT and customs duty costs for my customers? Which means that basically this is number two of those options where we're going to uh, pay it at this end. Now, this was what HMRC have said which I found was quite interesting and I thought really useful for everybody. And I will put this up on the Brexit Hub. Normally, your courier or parcel operator will collect any customs duty and VAT from your customers before delivering the goods. Now, we're aware that that happens, that they will ask for this to be paid before they'll deliver the goods at the other end. But this was the interesting bit, which I, I thought was worth pointing out. Most couriers or parcel operators will give you the option to move the goods on a delivered duty paid basis. Uh, they'll allow you to pay the costs up front and the courier or parcel operator will to deliver the goods without collecting any duty or tax from your customers. To find out more about moving on this, please contact your courier or parcel operator's website for more information. Now, the reason I've put this up is we've had some discussions and questions on that when you're advertising online, because in the UK, we uh, advertise our goods, unless you're a wholesale uh, wholesaler selling to retail, you're probably selling your goods at a VAT inclusive price. So when you sell on your website, if somebody in the UK buys yours, they will pay that price and that will include VAT and you'll declare the VAT. But when you sell to Europe, you're exporting at zero rate VAT. So what do you do? Maybe this is another ethical conundrum, but, we, I have one member whose clients at the moment are still selling at the same price, regardless. And if their customer is coming back and saying to them, hang on, I don't think I should be paying VAT anymore, repaying the VAT to them and saying, no, you're absolutely right. Sorry, hands up, we shouldn't have charged you VAT. We're going to, uh, we'll pay you the VAT back. Because at the moment they're selling it, let's say you're selling something for 40 pounds. In this country, that's 40 pounds, including VAT, but to Europe, it's 40 pounds without VAT. So you're actually making a little bit more profit on this, but you do have additional costs because you're gonna have to pay additional costs for delivery and customs, unless you're actually uh, ordering something like that. So it might be an interesting thing to do. Interestingly enough, I ordered some plants online to come in uh, some you know, uh, small, uh, a small shrub or something I've ordered online, which is actually coming from the Netherlands. I didn't realize until after I'd placed the order. And when I read the, uh, the actual order that was online, there is a comment on there that says, this price includes duties and taxes. So I'm hoping that when it arrives, I'm not gonna have to pay anything more because the seller who's based in the Netherlands is paying the import tax for me. And that's been included in the price I paid. So we're gradually getting clear on this. And the other thing that's, um, that's come out this week on this is that for certain customers who are delivering and selling into Europe, sometimes the customers are being charged import VAT and sometimes they are not. And there seems to be no hard and fast rule at the moment. And I'm, I'm wondering if because the EU VAT system is changing from the 1st of July, whether they're being quite flexible and easy on this. And if you remember last week, we looked at, I put something up from uh, the post office with the customs forms that if it was under a hundred pounds, you fill out your own customs form. If it's over a hundred pounds, the post office does it for you because you have to do commodities and all sorts of things. And I'm just wondering if some of the, uh, some of the European countries are saying, well, okay, if it's below a certain amount, because of that's changing in July, we're actually not gonna to bother too much. Now that is purely anecdotal. I don't know if that's what's happening. So these are the sort of things that will be quite useful to have uh, from people as uh, our information becomes 
more details as more of you get involved in this and, and let us know. And we've already got some confirmation on how the deferred import VAT is working and the sort of codes that you're using. Um, all three uh, software companies, that's uh, Sage, Zero, and QuickBooks, as I understand, have issued new VAT codes for uh, deferred, uh, reverse charge deferred VAT, uh, postponed VAT, import VAT. Um, but there seems to be a bit of controversy with, I think it's Sage at the moment, because they have a domestic reverse charge and they have a CIS reverse charge. So be very careful which one you choose, because I think um, you now have uh, a reverse charge for import VAT and you have a reverse charge coming in for CIS VAT. So you just need to be very careful which one you use. It doesn't make any difference uh, to the final VAT return. Um, that's the link. Now, that's the use of the link which uh, Iris has put up on the chat line for you. This is to this particular bulletin, um, which has got a whole list of questions and answers, which some of which were useful and some of which weren't. OK, so uh, that's, as I said, is a lot of information there today. Uh, let me just grab a mouthful of tea while I see where we are. Can I get on the chat line? Uh, let's have a look. Um, where are we? Oh, yes, it's still there. Uh, Michelle Torina, I think that is pronounced. Uh, Tim and Accounting just saying it's to show they're working rather than furlough as their jobs might be at risk. Uh, Torina, uh, Michelle, put this up as you were finishing your yeah. sentence about uh, why do you think people are doing this? So it's interesting. And Joanna's, Joanne said a very similar thing. Um, yeah, mortgage advisors are requesting it because they're aware that the furlough affects the credit rating of the employee, which is exactly what I thought, because I just wanted to confirm that I wasn't sort of reading something into it. So interestingly enough, um, Leslie and I had a, a somewhat heated discussion on this. I, I, I raised this to him earlier to see what his views were. And um, we had we had quite a quite an interesting discussion on the on the where's and why falls and what you should do on this one. Um, but yes, because if you're being furloughed for a length of time, it could be that your job is at risk. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, basically, uh, what's this? We've got uh, Elaine Botfield there saying it would be a real pain. You'd have to redo the lot. But then Susan yeah. Brewer saying, I would say no, um, we shouldn't be hiding further on places. Um, and they're looking for decent information on which to base a mortgage. So um, I think that's probably going to be the general. Yeah. Um, Leander Dado, having gone through this myself, some banks and building societies are declining mortgages where applicants are on furlough due yeah. to if jobs will remain. I think that's pretty obvious, isn't it, really? Yeah. I mean, furloughing, it's a stopgap, and hopefully everybody that's on furlough will get their job back, but I don't think there's any guarantees. Um, yeah. No, I mean, we were listening to the local news the other day, and they were saying that um, come April, um, if and when this all opens up, but we're not going to be fully open by April, I don't think yet. But the businesses are having to start paying business rates again, unless the government can defer that or do that. So it's going to start costing um, employers an awful lot more money as well from April. So I still don't think we're anywhere close to seeing the end of redundancies. Graham Swanell, are the consultants trying to mislead the building societies? Why are the lenders asking for this? Or are they concerned that employment will be at risk when the government scheme ends? We, yeah, I think we sort of agreed that. Uh, the point C, however, is an important. What are the bookkeeper's liabilities under AML? Um, I think you need to know why they're doing it. Um, and if it is to give a, an unfair view of the position as far as long-term employment is concerned, then it's it's more of a fraud to begin with but i think it is something that we as professional bookkeepers should not get involved with and we should tell them in no uncertain terms that um they shouldn't be doing it either you know um he said i would feel uncomfortable reducing two documents yeah and, and again uh, two sets of pay slips with slightly different wording on it i mean you know that doesn't make any sense to me no. uh, you've made an error then obviously you demand the old pay slip back before issuing a new one, or I would suggest that's what you do. Um, uh, but yeah, this is this um, not what it's about. Yeah, Nicola's just said that there was an article uh, from which in September 2020 that said Virgin Money and TSB will not consider furlough workers for mortgages because you know at the moment that that could be 80%, it could be the full amount, but it's, um, it's, yeah. it's interesting, isn't it, for anyone? 
I mean, Judith Siddle came up with a good one there um, because I was thinking when they were saying it before, I mean, normally you don't see every single payslip. You see, uh, well, in my case, if ever I've wanted anything, then my uh, FD has provided a figure for what I earned last year or something. Yeah, or something. yeah. Uh, but it, it obviously, if you're self-employed or something like that, well, you wouldn't do it on the payroll, would you? No, no, I can't think. No, I mean, self, self-employment has is is based it's, on uh, the tax return, but for employees, exactly. so, I mean, presumably, you, you really know. I mm. think what what. The last time I did one of these, it was a good few years ago when I was applying for a mortgage, you had to give proof of income from things like two bank statements and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. You showed your income going in. Have the links gone up on the chat, says Catherine. Uh, yes, I uh, think they're right at the top, top of the chat line. There's the uh, the bulletin and the Agent 82, and um, there's a link to the Getting Help with the Job Retention Scheme. So the three at the very top of the chat line are the three links that I had in on the notes for you. Thank you. Barbara Hague says if you Google Incoterms, I-N-C-O-T-E-R-M-S 2020 and click on images, there are some good illustrations on the different options for importing, exporting goods. Yeah. Yeah, oh. Incoter in Incoterms is, uh, is a good one. Catherine, I have a client who sells a small amount of goods on their website, EU. What we do is use the VAT element, which was in their sales price, to cover the postage. So do not charge a shipping charge to the customer. The customer will still be liable for VAT and duty at their end. But I was interested to hear about the delivered duty paid, which I will look into. Yeah. So there we are, Catherine. Um, it's been worth you tuning in again. Yeah, Great. well, I think that was um, I knew you could do it, but I wasn't really aware of, of how you did it. And that's just seemed to sum up quite nicely for me so it's worthwhile looking into it um i know we've had uh, one member has agreed or client has agreed who does this quite a lot to actually split the cost um and i don't quite know how they're doing that yet but they're, they're splitting the cost i think they've reduced the uh vat customs say to the price down by 10 percent, and the, they're splitting it with the clients but there are so many ways you can do this but it's rapidly coming round that unless you're dealing in major sales to eu customers that it's mm. probably better just to not worry worry about registering uh for vat in in the european countries and uh, deal with the vat paid on a separate issue it's going to be a lot less hassle if we can do it that way and if you can keep your customers the problem is keeping the customers because the prices will go up so Susanna Whelan says some of the news websites are saying that Rishi Sunak is going to announce that the furlough and size schemes will be extended into the summer well, yeah, I'm hearing that as well. I mean, I did ask him if he could hang on because uh, we quite like thanks fellow it's Friday. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, seriously, there are a lot of people still not mm. sure of when they can go back, if they can go back. There's a lot of speculation going on at the moment. Um, I mean, I've been looking at the various papers, um, newspapers on the BBC website, so their front page headlines. And when they're not worried about the Duke and Justice of Sussex, um, what they do tend to be uh, talking about is when we're all going to uh, get allowed to go back, when the lockdown's going to stop. There is no consistency across the eight or nine papers. Uh, and so, I, yeah, we, we will have to wait and see. I think there is talk of March the um, 3rd, obviously, the budget being, uh, it will be announced then. I'll have a feeling if anything's going to be announced, it'll obviously be before then. And there is a date next week, I think, isn't it, when Boris is supposed to be talking to us? Sorry, the Prime Minister is supposed to be talking to us. 22nd, isn't it? What? Yeah. Um, yeah, I know the numbers Monday, are dropping, Monday. but everybody's getting a, a jab and everybody's staying at home. And lo and behold, yeah, of course it's going to drop. Uh, but the thing is, when we all get let loose again, will it skyrocket? And I'm very pleased to say that Jackie and I have both had our jabs now. Did you react, Gary, can I ask? Um, no, I, I, you know, I, I can tell in my arm where it was, but yeah. no, I didn't if at all. I, I use this as an excuse to have a lie in, telling everybody <laughs> that I, I was just being yeah. careful. I, I was one of the, well, I was actually one of the 10% that did react. I had three days where I was uh, really in, it, it was like having flu. Um, and yeah, I, I was surprised. I, I, I'm never ill and I hardly ever ill. And uh, I was surprised that within 12 hours, I was starting to get very achy and things. It was all right. It was just more of a, no the headache was more of an annoyance than anything else. And I felt tired for three days. But by Tuesday, I had it Saturday. 
by Tuesday, I was I was fine again, but um, I didn't expect to get any reactions. Leslie, of course, who is a little bit older than me, nothing at all. No, not, not no. a reaction at all. So. Um, and yeah, uh, no, I, I was fine. The only problem I had was that um, when I turned up uh, to the centre, which was just outside Southampton, uh, I was stopped as I went into the car park. I gave my number at distance, you know, showed them my phone, etc. And I was um, told to move forward, which I did. And then lots of people were standing in the car park. There must have been almost one person for everybody that turned up. But then, anyway, I, I was guided round, and eventually I was guided back out of the centre. <laughs> and I said, no, this is one. So I had to come back through again. They said, oh, I'm sorry, oh. I thought you were leaving, not arriving. So I said, no, well, you know, I did try to park in a spot, but you pulled me out. So, oh. Yeah, yeah and no, I, I was lucky, actually. I, I went to my doctor and I had my, they run Saturday morning clinics. And I, I literally went right. down at five to nine and I was out by four minutes past nine. Um, very well organised, so. Well, I, the funny thing is that... Um, uh, Barclay, who everybody now knows, is going for his second jab tonight. Not COVID, obviously, but it's his, it's his puppy jab. And uh, when I was trying to book him in, they said, I'm sorry, we have a very short period now during which we can inject the dog. It's no, no longer a full day. We just have two hours at night. So he's going on at five. I said, I said oh, right. So, yes, well, everybody's doing COVID jabs for the rest of the day. So if you oh. go in and somebody grabs you by the scruff of the neck and shoves you, shoves you in the gut, then you know you've got one of those. But anyway, never mind. Oh, yeah. Right. But anyway, apparently I, I, you won't get a uh, hard pad or distemper either. So never mind. Um, um, OK, back to the question. Actually, Judith made a, a point on the um, the coronavirus um, claims. Um, she said, how are the total values on there? As as when I do a claim, we don't add individual amounts for each employee. Well, the answer, to Judith, is I don't know. But um, I am assured by HMRC that somehow they are picking it up, but I have no idea how that's working then. Um, if you're not putting individual claims up for everybody, just, just a full amount. I'm not sure then, to be honest. Um, oh, that's the INCO terms. Um, Catherine says, um, I have a, oh, I think you might have done this, Gary. I have a client who sells a small amount of goods on their website to the EU. Yeah. What we do is to use the VAT element, which was in their sales price, to cover the postage and do not charge a shipping charge to the customer. The customer will still be liable for VAT and duty. Yes. Yeah, so I think that's use, use that VAT to cover your costs. Yeah. Have you done um, 360 will include the furlough pay without distinction? It surely will suffice for mortgage. Uh, well, if you use the P60, yes, because that, that that's just gross income. That's just your income, isn't it? So, yeah, absolutely right. So if they can give, if they can take it from a P60, are we right to say that they must mention it on any information that um, bookkeepers provide? I don't know is the answer to that one. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure. There are still some people saying they can't see the link. So hopefully you've all got the links now that is there. Uh, my chat line is. No, a few saying that. Yeah. Um, Iris is on today. Uh, Iris, can you have a look and just make sure? Oh, I think up. they've gone up to panelists and attendees now, so hopefully they should be down at the bottom. I can see them. So, yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, um, furlough's qualifying date be pushed back from October to, say, December, Subaru Land. Um, not sure. Sorry, what was that one? Was uh, From Subaru Land, um, will furlough's qualifying date be pushed back from October to, say, December? I need to look into this this date for pay because I um, at the moment it's still, if you're talking about the uh, the qualifying dates for what you work out you pay it's still going back to last February which is over a year ago now so the answer is I'm not sure about that I think that might be what you're talking about. Um, Adam Adam has come up that happened to my daughter last summer she had to go through a lot of hoops to get confirmation that her job was secure. A primary school teaching position. Luckily, she's now moved into a new home. Um, and Josh says, oh, I think, thank you, Josh. This is for your, uh, let's keep, what are we going to do with thank fellow? It's right. Josh says, watching with my colleagues in the office, I think these videos become a fixture in our diaries. Very useful information. Oh, and I think you can see the links now. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, no, that, 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 that's fantastic. No, we will be doing something on thank fellow. It's Friday, but hopefully, in the not too distant future, furlough will become a thing of the past and we'll be back onto something else. So, you know, we've already asked for suggestions for the F. 
Um, but anyway, um, and we've had several, as we've said before. Um, but I think uh, I think Furlow has surely got to be with us for some time yet. And I think the big challenge for all ICB bookkeepers now is to build up that momentum that they've created during furlough and make sure that, um, you know, we, we help our clients get out of this mess as much as we can. And somebody said to me the other day, well, I, you know, I, I, as the bookkeeper, what can I do? Well, you know, look, as the bookkeeper, you can take one huge headache off their shoulder and, and give them time to get out and sell. Because whilst they're not messing about doing their books, they're spending more hours on the road or in the shop or, or wherever, just making more money. So that, that's the way as far as I'm concerned. Better do some questions. What have we got here? Whoops. Um, I, right, there's one from Nicola. Uh, I seem to remember hearing some time ago that a bank would treat furlough earnings as being equivalent to one pounds. In other words, would not include it as earned income for mortgage purposes. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to alter the pay slips. Uh, sorry, no, we have looked. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of sync with where we are on these now at the moment. Yeah, no, um, I mean, I, th I think that generally speaking, you shouldn't alter a pay slip. Um, if, the if the lender says they're taking it into account that it's furloughed and they're not sure about the job, surely any lender who's given a figure will just check how is your job or they'll know anyway. So, um, yeah, no, you, you shouldn't go back and, and do this. Um, uh, so. Right. One on claims, overpaying claims back. Uh, Maggie says, uh, if an overclaim has been made for January, but no further claim to be made or February, do we repay the money using the claim reference number? Yes, you do. If you contact HMRC or, or somehow you get that ref payment reference number, you pay the money to HMRC with the reference number and that and that will go against that. Um, Olivia says here, sales Northern Ireland to Ireland, D to C is charged plus UK VAT. Yes, don't forget that this is uh, Brexit fact. Don't forget, if you're based in Northern Ireland, that your system hasn't changed. Because if you're selling to anywhere in, in Europe, whether it's Northern Ireland, France, Germany, Spain, wherever, you're still dealing with the old uh, business B to C, B to B. So if you're selling to a private customer, you'll charge UK VAT. And if you're selling business to business, you'll exchange VAT numbers and uh, sell it as an EC sale, and you will have to report an EC sale still. So Northern Ireland hasn't changed. Um, Northern Ireland has become far more complex because they've now got the old system plus the uh, additional um, customs forms that need to be completed for dealing with uh, sales from Great Britain as well, because you've still got that those customs declarations to be made. Although I did read in the paper earlier this week that the costs and the speed of this is beginning to settle down now so um hopefully government did say teething troubles will be over so hopefully that will solve itself carol um, gibbs i saw online today that the chancellor may extend furlough and the business rates holiday for the retail and hospitality sectors into the summer yes hi carol um yeah, I think something will have to happen. Uh, the conjecture at the moment is that the hospitality sector will be opening uh, in a very piecemeal fashion to begin with, um, particularly pubs, I think, are regarded as a bit too close for comfort. And that could be into May or June, possibly longer. Who knows? I, the trouble is with a lot of the stuff that's in the press, it is complete conjecture and it, it makes headlines and various other things. So it's a wait and see. But I don't think they're going to leave us quite out to dry. Um, you know, they're, they're going to try. They're going to come up with something, surely. But anyway, thanks for that. Um, OK, Sue's come back. Sue, uh, oh, this is about the qualifying for October. Um, if you had taken on stuff after October, do they qualify for furlough? No, I don't. No, you're right. They don't. And I have not seen anything that extends that date. Um, if this continues on, for much longer than I think they might change the date, but at the moment, Sue, I think it's still if they were, if you'd done that RTI submission by the 30th of October, then they're uh, valid for furlough. If it was not done by then, then you can't pay them for, you can't claim furlough back. No, I haven't seen that that's changed at all. Um, Lindsay Kennedy, a very specific one here. Hi, any of you have that question? Apologies for you. Heard it before my client is advertising on facebook the receipts are a bit vague but i have managed to get facebook ireland as the supplier 
and there is an address as Dublin mm -hmm. with an IE XXXX VAT mm -hmm. number. Mm -hmm. Is this a digital service? How should this be entered on the VAT return from January? Um, now, the digital service on the Brexit hub, I've actually put a definition of what a digital service is. Um, and I think there might be a link to it because there are digital services and there are e-services. Now, uh, you are buying the service, presumably. Not a sale, it's a purchase. So uh, if you, I've certainly got a list of what constitutes a digital service. I have to say, um, Facebook in, in Ireland um, has always caused me a bit of a problem. And it may be that someone else has dealt with this and knows the answer to that. If it is a digital service, it should come to you, correct me somebody if I'm wrong, with no VAT and you put it in as a reverse charge. But if you're selling, then again, you will probably, if it counts as a digital service, you will have to register with someone in Europe, uh, probably Ireland and, and register for that. So I'm not sure whether that's a sale or a a purchase Lindsay if you've got any queries um, just come back Susan Bruland has just come back and uh, I don't know I don't yeah no got... sorry that's I've answered that one Gary that one that's great okay um they seem to have quietened down a little bit just while you gather your breath a little bit um just a couple of uh points of interest I mentioned um recently uh certainly over the last two uh thanks to uh, it's Fridays that as part of our ongoing AML campaign, all members of our council are being uh, inspected. And I'm very pleased to say that Kirsty Sinjin has just come through as compliant. So well done, Kirsty. Another one on the list there. Everybody, everybody else is going through. Now, obviously, as a member of council, they're expected to be absolutely squeaky clean. So uh, it, it's good that you know that when you're talking to council and your council are representing you, that uh, you've got good people there. Um, we we sort of I sort of anticipated Kirsty would get it right because I know she's she's done a lot on this as a branch chair and she's worked with other people, including Lucy Brown and I mention that because Lucy Brown uh, is actually joining ICB as its director of professional standards. Uh, she will be joining shortly. She's going to look at professional standards across the board to incorporate anti-money laundering, but also all sorts of standards on professionalism and assisting us to. Uh, further enhance the reputation of ICB bookkeepers. So she's not just a director of professional standards, she's a director of ICB professional standards. Um, Paula Vesey Smith, who is our chair of the advisory council, she was actually on mic on Monday. I, I know a lot of you actually caught that. Uh, we've had a lot of very positive feedback. Uh, she was recently found to be compliant, but I know having spoken to Paula, who is normally very blasé about such things. She was certainly sounding a little bit nervous as, as the time approached of her inspection. But uh, anyway, it, it, it went through without a hitch. So that was really good. And very nice that she'd share the details and the experience with you on Mike on Monday. Mike on Monday going down very well at the moment. We do get quite big audiences for that. And uh, it's quite interesting that we're finding that people who go on to Mike on Monday um, are actually then making very minor amendments to their records, etc., and getting themselves into a, uh, a much more positive frame. So that's that's very good. Uh, the more information you can use and find, uh, the better it is. Uh, and I've just joined a thing called the Transparency Task Force, um, which is uh, sort of related to the entire financial function, not just bookkeeping and accountancy. And they've got some eye-watering problems on there as well. And um, we were uh, last night, the uh, meeting that we had was talking about the HBOS problem and the fact that the um, auditors, you might have heard of them, KPMG, um, they missed an £80 billion hole in the accounts. Um, so, you know, it fortunately wasn't a very big hole. So it, it, it's one of those simple things to miss. Um, but uh, anyway, they, they were the same auditors that were handling the co op. Uh, when, when that went to pot and and also carillion so you'd think you'd get three strikes and you're out really wouldn't you but they're still there but uh, i i think that uh, moves are afoot to change the audit yeah. profession 
Um, yeah, I've been but, reading. I've been reading some updates on that, Gary. That they they've obviously become very concerned about this, and there are new rules and regulations that I think will be coming out to to stiffen uh, and toughen up the audit. Yeah, I mean, there was talk about you could either be an accountant or an auditor, but not both. But again, if you know, uh, yeah, they split off a bit of it and become audit only, and there's a few Chinese walls thrown in there. Uh, yeah. Basically, I think the people last night were saying that you've got to have a very tough division under the FCA that looks into these things and, and really starts naming and shaming. Uh, but anyway, such as such is, uh, such is like, but I'll let you know how future meetings um, go on. But it's quite interesting what uh, people have to say about transparency. OK, um, one of the things that we're looking to do, Gary, is um, on Technical Tuesday, just uh, something that we've we're still trying to finalise a date, but we are going to be doing a session on Technical Tuesday on tax agents and how to become tax agents. And uh, I'm thrilled to say that I'm going to be joined by Verna Gilveer from HMRC. Now, those of you, a lot of you may know Verna because she did the summit with us. Hmm. She did one of the sessions at the summit in November and no she's also been on the previous summit as well and she's agreed to come on and have a we're going to sort of do a question and answer and throw some ideas around but I want her to go through exactly uh, what's involved in becoming a tax agent because we've covered this before I've done some articles on it but I'm still getting a lot of people are still getting confused about how you actually add various things onto your tax agent how you become a tax agent um, one of my questions will be why uh, when HMRC are trying to become the most progressive digital tax service in the world, you still have to apply in writing to an office and it takes eight weeks to go through. So that would be one of my questions for her. But I'm sure she will have a very well prepared answer because she's good. So I, I don't know when that's going to be, possibly two to three weeks time, we're trying to set that up, Gary, which might be one for your diary when it comes out. If that's more for anyone who's new into this, because with the, uh, from April, don't forget, making tax digital, uh, is going to be extended for that. There's a trial opening up. The trials are opening up for MTD for self-assessment fairly soon. And if you want to get involved in that, you will need to have your MTD tax agents account. So she's going to come along and talk to us about that. Yeah. So thanks, Olivia. Yes, that's what it's there for. So how to become a tax agent. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's something that our members should know about and be doing and just making sure they, they do a good job uh most people that i go to in organizations speak very highly of ICB bookkeepers and, and that's that's fantastic and it's, it's what we're here for it's what lucy brown's going to help us with you know she's got quite a big job on actually because she's, she's going to look across the whole spectrum from um you know how we get people in at the front end to how we dispose of them at the other end i suppose um, if, if, if you want to put it like that hatched matched mm. and batched as we used to call it in newspapers yeah um <laughs> couple of questions come in on the chat line uh, from Valerie and I think someone else asked is do we know when the postponed import fact statements will be issued I'm monitoring the page but nothing yet I thought it was towards the end of this month because if you think about it January was the first month that that's going to go through and it's going to be postponed so it's going to be the least the end of this month but I just have this funny feeling in the middle of March springs to mind so that's the first one and uh, Judith said, uh, I am furloughed from a bar job. The furlough is not currently on my personal tax cap. It's not due to go out, Judith, until at least the 25th of February. So it won't be on there yet, but it might be worthwhile. Those of you who perhaps, you know, have been furloughed from something or know of somebody who is going to your personal tax account uh, after the 25th of February. And I'd be interesting to see what sort of information comes up on there. Obviously, uh, no names, no patrol, no figures, but it will be interesting to get some feedback from you when that's opened about what you can someone can actually see on that. Um, oh, one, got in a... the last one coming, I don't think we should mention the name under the circumstances, but one of our members, I have a quick ethical question. The client rang yesterday to ask if he was OK to recruit a new employee whilst an existing member of the team was fully furloughed. On asking for more information, she said the furloughed employee was a new recruit just before the November not lockdown who isn't able to work without another member of staff holding her hand in the meantime the admin tasks are mounting up so they need to recruit someone to hold on to get on with the admin independently i said that i didn't feel it was my position to say yes or no but is anyone aware of any reason why they should not recruit the new member of staff ironically 
it was the client's HR person who was pressing for an answer before she issued the contract letter. If it's going to be... Um, well, there's nothing to stop them taking someone on, I don't think, if someone is, is furloughed, but... Why was the person what? taken on in the first place? Because yeah. they furloughed. If they were taken on, presumably they were taken on to do the job themselves. If you're now saying they couldn't do it without somebody holding their hand, where was that person when they were originally taken? Yeah. Sounds a bit weird. There's more to I have to say, I'm not sure it's something that we can comment on because um, it's an HR thing rather than a, a bookkeeping thing. And, I, and I, I will keep coming back to the fact that ICP, we're here to support you, but we're not a, an institute of HR and that sort of thing. We are bookkeepers and, you know, I can go through how to claim the furloughs, but the actual ethical legal side, we've had, we've actually had something along this before where at the, in the early days there were furloughs and they were taking people on a, on a voluntary basis to do the job. Yeah, but this one, if he is going to be paid, no, it's a very, I, it doesn't sound right to me somehow. Surely you, you take the person off furlough, she comes back and does the job. Well, There's nobody there to hold her hand. Where was the other person? Does that mean you've laid more people off or something, rather? I mean, you also then you've got to look at the case of whether that person should be employed. And I'm not even going to go down that route. No. Uh. And no. I don't actually think you're going to get an answer to that because um, whoever you're going to ask, um, one of, I think, we have to be very careful about the advice we give out, don't we, Gary, because of all sorts of things, um, legal issues. I don't, I don't think we can answer that one, do you, Gary? Well, I'm not really, no. I mean, I, I can give you a sort of a view of, you know, as I just have done. It doesn't sound yeah. right, but that isn't, a, that isn't a decision as such. I think you need no. more information, or, or somebody would, um, but I would check it out. I mean, HR, you know, yeah. People are quite often HR people. It just means that they look after <clears throat> paperwork. It doesn't really mean they're qualified because an HR yeah. person should be able to call upon their own professional. Voice yeah, I mean, the members the members just come back and said, I didn't feel I could answer it either. And I think, I think that is something which falls outside the realm of our uh, professional indemnity because, you know, we are bookkeepers. We're not HR people. And we, I don't think we should be giving advice and guidance on anything outside what you're actually doing. And that for me is an employment issue. Difficult one though. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's probably best as you say, which is a shame because I, I always think that the good thing about ICB is it will answer your questions, but uh, I don't think we, as you say, I don't think we can answer that one because it's a little bit, it's a little bit outside the scope. But, you know, if in doubt, I would suggest at the moment you don't do it until somebody tells you that you can. But not us. No, so, and I don't know who you would go to as, as as the bookkeeper for the client. I'm not sure you should be going there taking advice. My gut reaction is your client should be should be taking the advice, or certainly well, their HR, HR department should be. Uh, which is why I say if they've got a HR department, she presumably that or he, the HR person, will be a member of some organisation in order to become a HR person. If they are, then they'll get the advice. Um, Joanna's just come back on that saying, I have a client who has an employee on furlough as she received a letter to isolate. The employer has just employed someone else to cover. Now that's probably that's okay it. because they have, because they've, they've had to isolate. And if the job's doing, I don't see that there's an issue with that. No. Um, what happens at the end of the isolation period, of course, is another thing, because if there's only one job, one of those may very well have to be laid off at the end. And then you're into all sorts of legal implications about laying people off. And don't forget, if you if you make somebody else, if you lay someone else off, then you've got HR. Um, but I think this other one is is slightly uh, different to that because that might be a competence job. Because working for if they're working from home, for example, but they can't work from home because they're not capable of working from home on their own. One wonders if that should be someone that's furloughed because they've not been furloughed because the work's not there. Um, I mean, as Gary has said before, all of our members, including some very new members of staff that have started with us within the last year, are all working from home and um, are doing an amazing job. 
Yeah, I, I, they are, absolutely. And I mean, the, the thing is that if if you've laid somebody off, you're bringing somebody in because that person needs a hand-holding in that particular case. As I said, the only bit that worries me on that is, well, what's going to happen afterwards? Is, like you said, yeah. you know, does that mean there's going to be two employees there or what? Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't sound as if it's been a two-employee job in the past somehow. No, but and there's the same thing, I think, with, uh, with the other one. Okay, no. um, uh, right. That's all of those questions. I think we've actually covered uh, all of the questions. Okay. Good. I think we're. I think we're just about. I there think now, all my. But I've, I've got no more messages coming through. I, I tend to get messages coming through for people who want to remain anonymous or whatever. They've got. They've got to do. Okay, everybody. So um, there's a newsletter coming out shortly. So look out for that. Um, there will be all sorts of things coming out over the next couple of weeks. Obviously, we've got Mike on Monday. We've got Jackie on Technical Tuesday. Uh, probably not going to be doing Technical Tuesday next week. I may do one the following week. All right. Just to set some, I don't. I think at the moment I'm looking at possibly every other week. But um, there, I don't think I've got anything planned for Tuesday, unless uh, somebody wants just to run a follow up on. I think Absolutely you mentioned question. something earlier on that you were going to do in your, on the next Technical Tuesday. You, oh, no, that was the HMRC. Yeah, That's the HMRC one, which oh, okay. may be in two weeks. It may be in three weeks. But we, we're trying to finalise the date. But it was too soon to get it set up for this Tuesday. Um, so if, if people have got lots of questions that they want to ask, don't forget, if you have got any queries, send them in. If I find there are things that are worth discussing, we can very quickly set up a, a Technical Tuesday to answer any questions or anything burning that people want to know. So again, if there's any particular topic you're looking for that you want some me or someone else to do, then um, do yeah. let us know and we'll try and set something up ASAP for you. Just a quick note there from Sue Bruins to say thank you to us both. Uh, we don't normally mention it, but that's because they only normally mention Jackie, but she's mentioned me as well. So I'm going to have that one. So thank you, Sue. <laughs> oh, that's no. I say I couldn't yeah. do it without you, Gary. Couldn't do it without no, you. If, uh, you know, Jackie deserves the praise if she if she if it comes in we normally mention it but uh, it, it's very nice of you when you do that um, and Kirsty's in there just jumping in thanks to you both <laughs> as normal right okay it's only because I've said you you've become compliant and, and ah great. you see I've expected <laughs> nothing less Kirsty yeah yeah anyway so um, yeah and we've got a few other things in the pipeline uh, I mentioned wages Wednesday or something like that that'll be coming up soon um, not quite sure we'll be quite ready for next Wednesday but we're going to do a, a sort of an extended program all about payroll and various things that are going on there's quite a few changes we're trying to we're taking advice at the moment is when would be the best time to do that bearing in mind April the 5th and everything else coming up so we will probably do something before something afterwards um, that's there uh, I'm still hoping to get my man talking about fraud, um, and uh, he's, he's really in high demand at the moment, but that will be in shortly. And a couple of other interesting things and some, some more other interviews uh, with fellow members and various people like that, uh, some industry people coming on. But look out for your emails. And we do get a number of you that whenever we send out an email, you unsubscribe. And then when we ring up and say, did you realize you've unsubscribed? We say, oh, no, no, I didn't realize I'd done that. Well, uh, the thing is, we do send you out important information. And even something like this, although, thank fellow, it's Friday, we have a, a sort of a quite fun time on this. The, the stuff that Jackie's putting out here is very, very serious. Most of the stuff she does on Tuesday is absolutely critical to what you do. And certainly Mike on Monday, um, mm -hmm. you know, and Woofer Wednesday, we might put on the need necessarily have listened to that one but i think that the point is that you shouldn't unsubscribe for this i know it's a bit of a nuisance if we send you lots of different bits of information pick and choose but you know don't miss the critical thing just because you think oh, i'm fed up with listening to um you're getting emails from icb they are very important and we, we will um, give you a call if you unsubscribe and you know hopefully you need uh, inadvertently although to be honest it, it's quite a drawn out process so i'm not quite sure how you do it inadvertently but never mind so um, it looks like being a thoroughly wet weekend where I am. Um, and uh, so I hope some of you get a bit of sunshine. Have a, a good week out there. I hope some of you, some more of you will be getting your jabs. I can, I can highly recommend it uh, for a man who hates needles. Um, 
I, I certainly looked the other way, but uh, it, it was easy, very simple. And once I'd answered my name, um, date of birth and various other things on at least nine separate little staging posts <laughs> as I walked through the room. Um, yeah, uh, it, it was fine. And uh, it, um, hopefully uh, I booked it for my second one in May. And yeah, it, we all need to do it. We've, we've all yeah, got to do anything absolutely. that we can do to help with this, we should be doing. Um, so, yeah, um, even even if you're one of those 10 percent that throws out reaction like I was, because um, it, it, it wasn't unpleasant. It was annoying more than anything else, but it's still much better than getting the disease. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's the point. So anyway, um, don't cut loose and go fancy free at the moment. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of the stuff still out there and we, we've got to hang in. Uh, whether or not you normally like listening to politicians now is the time at least to to do what they say, because whether they do it right or wrong, they're trying. I think they're trying their best, all of them. And uh, we, we've got to try and get rid of this. And the latest news, I, I believe, is that we're never actually going to get rid of this. This is going to become like the annual flu jab. We're just going to have to put yeah. up with it. So who knows? Um, but still. So, Jackie, thank you very much once again. Um, Lovely. If we don't see you on Tuesday, we'll see you next Friday. I'll start to be here next Friday. Yes. Yes, I will be. If any of you have got anything out, anything out there that you think is pressing that we should be giving you our opinion on, or at least asking you your opinion, uh, please let us know. So bye for now, everybody. Take care. Have, have a good, good weekend. Day. Bye.